My friend Mike works for the city's CCTV archives and he has seen some disturbing things. I hadn't seen Mike in a few months. He'd been buried in work and our usual weekend nights out had about disappeared. Then he called me on a Thursday and invited me over for drinks. I jumped at the invite but took note of how depressed he sounded on the phone. By the time I got there, Mike had already started drinking and was slurring his words. A dark cloud seemed to hover over him, which got worse as we drank. I finally asked what was going on with him. Mike turned darker. He said it had to do with work. I never really knew what Mike did for a living. I did know he worked for the city in the tech department and was involved with CCTV surveillance networks, but I never knew what his day-to-day -day operations were, which he began to describe in detail. Mike explained there were thousands of cameras scattered throughout the downtown core, outlying neighborhoods and well into the suburbs of our 1 million plus city. His responsibility was to categorize and archive all the incoming footage. Most of the footage went into very general classifications and were saved in hard drive farms and identified with lengthy combinations of numbers and letters for categorical archiving. They were truly meant to be forgotten about. It was an expensive task, but Mike designed and built an AI screening program that detected common patterns of footage, then sectioned out anomalous behavior for review. The vast majority wasn't noteworthy, something like 99%. Then there was the 0.01%, the car accidents, assaults, swarmings, abductions, murders. Those went into a special archive for use in criminal investigations. And then there was the 0.001%. They were held in a classified archive and contained footage capturing events that for all accounts was unexplainable. This was called the Tartarus Archive. Tartarus, the word for the ancient Greek prison where the Titans were held. As it turned out, the name was quite fitting to the archive's growing contents. Some footage could be simplified to strange optical anomalies in the camera and coincidences of light or crackheads on a bender through the subway systems. Other footage though, defied logic. The others are what captured Mike's mind that evening. He'd been breaking protocol and bringing hard drives at home at night. In fact, he'd been splicing the footage together, capturing and compiling repeat aberrations and editing them into a linear sequence. Mike wanted to show me some. It wasn't a bragging or showing off kind of way. It felt more like sharing of a heavy burden kind of way. I asked if showing me would get him into trouble, but he waved the ideal way. In my mind, I thought, yeah, obviously I want to see what's going on in my city. Michael led me into his workroom, where he had monitors and towers and piles of externals set up. We sat down, and he skimmed through some hard drives a little bit nervously. Then he landed on one. Mike told me this anomaly was codenamed Link Inspector. He then pressed play. On the largest screen, 
black and white footage started up, showing Lincoln Avenue, one of our less attractive downtown streets at 3 a.m. The camera angle showed the length of Lincoln Avenue as it led into the downtown core. The street appeared empty and quiet. From a side road, a woman emerged, walking towards the camera. As she approached the intersection, she turned over her shoulder and appeared to scream. The woman took off, sprinting past the camera, which cut to a new wire angle from another camera across the street. We watched the woman running frantically, seemingly being chased. But she was the only one on the street. There was no one else around her. The woman kept screaming as she ran, and the camera kept following, cutting between different angles. We watched as the woman was chased into the middle of an empty intersection. She fell and cowered as if something massive was standing over her. Then the woman's neck stiffened and she began to levitate off the ground. Her body looked like a rag doll as something lifted her by the throat until she was floating. A dozen feet above the road in the middle of the intersection and the woman's head stabbed to the left and her body fell to the ground. Then the video ended went black. I sat shocked. Mike saw my expression and said, there's a lot more. I asked if that was real, if what I saw was unaltered, was raw footage. Mike said all he did was put the clips together. None of the content had been touched. He told me the incident was classified as a hit and run by the department and the case was left figuratively open for more evidence to amass, which it would never. The department kept the footage hidden, claiming it was a camera malfunction. No one outside of Mike and his boss had seen the video of how the poor woman actually died. I started to understand the air of somberness Mike was carrying around. Mike started the next video. This one was named Codename Black Crab. It was much longer than the previous one. It started in the subway systems at the underground walkway station. Shortly after closing up for the night, Walkley was the last stop on the route and the exterior was shouldered by a new housing development on one side and untouched forest and swampland on the other. The camera was pointed down along the subway platform on the east side and showed its entire land with benches and garbage cans populating it. At the far end, the tunnel was filled with darkness. The lights on the platform shut off and the station went dark. The camera switched to night vision and everything became visible again. My eyes strained on the platform waiting for something to happen. Finally, there was movement. It was coming from the tunnel. It was difficult to identify what it exactly was at the first sight. As its movement were strange and the footage was grainy, I got closer to the camera and I got a better look. It resembled a person, a man. He was walking on his hands and feet, upside down, with his back arched and his, and his stomach pointed to the ceiling. He had long dark hair that dragged along the ground and he wore tattered layers of old jackets and torn pants. He... I don't know how to describe this but he moved like a crab. Jerkily, 
yet quickly and easily as he made his way to the staircase. The footage cut to a new camera in the dark hallway leading to the stairs out of the station. We watched the crab walker claw up two steps at a time and then claw over the turnstiles and towards the exit. The footage cut again, now showing the exterior of the station entrance. The crab walker squeezed and twisted and maneuvered his body through the locked and closed entrance gate. It, it looked impossible to accomplish, but he did. Once outside, the crab walker eyed his surroundings before skittering off towards the woods and disappearing. The footage cut to an hour later and revealed the crab walker reappearing from the woods. He was dragging a small animal by the tail in his teeth. The animal looked like a cat. The crab walker squeezed back through the gate, crawled through the station, and disappeared into the subway tunnel. Again, Mike saw my expression and told me there was more. He showed me the length of the video, which was over an hour long. Mike had compiled over 20 sequences of the crab walker creeping out of the subway station into the woods. Mike skimmed through the video towards the end and we watched the crab walker come out of a sewer in a downtown alleyway. It crawled over a pile of garbage bags and cardboard boxes and then it jumped into them. Some kind of vicious frenzy ensued. There was someone else in the pile of garbage, hands and feet trashed about as they were struggling for their life. Then the camera stopped and hands and feet went still. The crab walker's body moved jerkily about. I couldn't see what was happening because of the darkness and all the garbage bags and boxes obscuring the camera's view. Mike leaned over to me and whispered that the crab walker was eating a homeless man. This caused a criminal investigation as the body was found mutilated and festering in the open alleyway. Mike followed up on the inquiry. What he discovered was the crab walker was who authorities believed to be a man called David Fletcher. Decades ago, David had been a prominent lawyer with a family. One Christmas, there was a house fire, and his wife and kids were killed in the blaze. It was David's fault. He lost everything, including his mind. Everyone has a breaking point, whether they know it or not. A place where they bend too far and then snap. David found his. Family and friends described his descent as nightmarish. David lived on the streets, became addicted to drugs, and tumbled into mental illness. The last anyone knew of him was from 10 years prior. He'd thrown himself in front of a subway car at the Walkley station, and no one heard from him since. It appeared that somehow, David had survived. His back had broken and healed strangely, causing him to move about as he did. He'd adapted to the new posture and lived in the darkness of the subway tunnels, finding sustenance from the drain water and the vile animals he caught. That was what Mike found out, at least. But then he said, that was just another answer the authorities gave me in discovery. Who knows what the truth is? Mike said there was always an answer for the videos he saw. Whether the answers were true or not, no one knew. But the ones that had become public all needed explanations. However absurd. Either way, David was never found, and didn't reappear on the subway footage. 
Mike plugged in a new hard drive. He poured a fresh drink and told me this was the one that was bothering him. The file was codenamed Cloud Mirror. I wasn't sure I wanted to see it, but before I could object, Mike pressed play. All the monitors lit up with footage from different intersections downtown on the exact same date and time as each other. There were five in total. The streets on each screen were empty and quiet, no cars or people. Suddenly, at the same time, in the center of the intersection, a small glow pulsed into existence. It was some kind of orb, roughly the size of a bowling ball. The street lights around it pulsed with energy waves. As the orb grew larger, it grew to the size of a beach ball. Then it flashed out. The street lights went back to normal, and the intersection was as lifeless as it was before. I asked Mike what they were. He told me he had gigs of footage of the orbs and had watched them repeatedly. He didn't know what they were at first. Then they started to change. Mike clicked onto the next video again. The five monitors lit up with the same intersections and time of night, but several weeks later, the street lights glowed and pulsed and an orb manifested into existence again. It grew to its beach ball size, but then altered its surface and glow. Something gas-like replaced it, growing outward into a couch-sized cloud of gray. One of the cameras was closer, so I got to see the small clouds in detail. It looked like volcanic ash, like a volcanic eruption wrapping around itself. They were large, constantly morphing blobs that curled outward from a glowing center, resembling a mental bulb fractal as a gaseous based organism. It was fascinating to see them floating in the middle of the street, so alien to our roads and stoplights and street lamps. Then they began to move. Sliding down empty roads, the cameras cut to different angles, following the cloud on some unknown path, zigging and zagging onto new streets and through alleyways. Then they stopped. The clouds hovered in the center of the intersection. They lowered to crown level, standing straight like a large coffin, holding rigid to the shape. Their exteriors continued to shift and mold together like magnets made out of smoke. Something on one of the monitors caught my eye. Down the street, people appeared. They'd seen the cloud and were walking towards it. The group looked drunk and fascinated by the floating entity. So much so, they were approaching it. As they did, the cloud became brighter. The street lamps around its pulsed. The group were in some kind of trance, staring into the morphing blob. One of the group, a guy, stared into it like a zombie, then walked right into the cloud and disappeared. None of the group tried to stop him. Instead, another one followed him in, and another, and another. All five members of the group disappeared into the cloud. Then they reappeared, one at a time. The guy who went first came out first. Then the others came out in the order they went in. Only they weren't stumbling and boisterous and drunk now. They were walking upright, using minimal movements. They formed a perfect five-person circle. For several seconds, over quick words, then turned and all went into separate directions. Their strides, arm swings, and speed all matched. Another monitor showed a similar situation with a larger group of people, lost in their reverie as they marched one after another. 
into the cloud. Each monitor showed the same thing now. People entering the cloud and coming back out. Different. Mike stopped the video. I asked if he showed this to anyone. He said he hadn't. Not even to his one boss. Which was a problem. Because he had a meeting with his boss in the morning to discuss the missing footage. I asked why he didn't show the footage to his boss. This footage seemed more than serious. People were being replaced by something. Mike sighed and put in a new video. The main monitor lit up and showed a new downtown street. The date was from earlier this week. One of the clouds was floating in the intersection. A middle-aged couple were walking nearby. The husband with a slight limp in his right leg. The couple saw the cloud and were sucked in by its aura. They approached it. Eyes wide and mouths open. Both the husband and wife entered the cloud and disappeared. After a moment, they appeared. The husband's limp was gone. Mike turned to me and said, that was my boss and his wife.